it's time for us to look at our big story for today. For young people between the ages of 15 and 35, this might be a good time as the National Economic Council has, has, has approved a special program, uh, a special program for young people who are in the ICT to the tune of $670 million. According to the Vice President, who is the Chairman of the National Economic Council, the essence of this program called IDICE is to encourage young people who are into the ICT and who are doing businesses related to technology in Nigeria. How will this play out in coming months? What are the concerns and what are some of the things that should be put in place to ensure that this program justifies the purpose intended? I have with me here Sam Horuji, who is going to provide his own perspective about this initiative. Glad you have you joined us this morning. Good morning, Femi. My pleasure to be here. And good morning, Blessing. Good morning. Thank you. All right. It was a historic one. The National Economic Council yesterday approved or gave approval for the implementation of this special tech and digital enterprise program to tune of $670 million. What do you make of this initiative? The timing, uh, you know, according to President Tinubu, is to ensure that uh, he makes everything possible to ensure that prosperity, you know, Nigerians experience what we call prosperity. And this is also in line with that. What do you make of this initiative and the timing for it? The ICT scale initiative uh, uh, is uh, welcoming. Uh, when you look at uh, the amount of money the federal government has devoted for this project and cut across uh, all the states of the federation. Uh, more importantly, uh, what that uh, social intervention is supposed to see is to provide an enabling environment uh, uh, for young people uh, to thrive uh, in uh, ICT entrepreneurship uh, program in Nigeria. And by implication, once um, that scheme is um, well resourced, uh, as it is now, and well implemented, and it's going to create um, some additional job, particularly uh, over 100,000 uh, youth per state uh, will be direct beneficiary. And on the long run, those indirect jobs that will be created uh, from that scheme will impact uh, uh, the citizens. But then, like every other government um, program in the past, what is important, according to uh, the Vice President, uh, Chetima, was saying that um, this will be implemented in full and uh, an evaluation will be made to sustain uh, economic prosperity for the youth, uh, particularly for direct uh, uh, beneficiary and the indirect jobs that will be created. So, but maybe as we pro uh, progress the conversation, we'll be able to speak to some other specific uh, uh, opportunities, uh, challenges and the prospects of this scheme. Okay, so this uh, program is supposed to kick off in a few weeks. Uh, so we were talking yesterday about uh, ICT in Nigeria and even the development of apps, the solutions that they provide. What's your, uh, what would be your recommendation towards the skills that will be provided in this program? So at the end of the day, it is not just about jobs being created, but jobs that translate to development. I think the, uh, the scheme itself is um, specialized. Uh, targeting ICT. So if you look at the entire ecosystem of ICT development, in terms of the skill set that they require, that is technical skills already. So what is important is that um, uh, the program initiative will address specific ICT uh, digital and creative enterprise program, which is the core element of it. So by that, once those skill sets have been acquired by the youth uh, within those age brackets, then those things will translate uh, into uh, job creation, employment opportunity. So you have direct uh, job creation and indirect job creation that will come out of that uh, enterprise development uh, that is driven by IT skills uh, development, ICT. Now, according to statistics provided for this program, um, about 175,000 young people are going to be trained and certified for this program is expected to also make impact on 75,000 know, enterprises and also to create about 800,000 jobs. 
And now there's a clause to it, which is going to take place in all the 36 states in Nigeria. But the president or the vice president, rather, have asked um, governors in respective states to provide representatives who are going to implement this program. How do you see this playing out? And then what should be put in place to ensure that the implementation of this program is achieved the way it ought to be done? Not just, not just like any other program where you're quick to announce, but when it comes to the issue of implementation, you always have challenges. And now that state governors have been brought in to provide representatives as a this program, what should be put in place to ensure that this program succeeds? Number one, uh, the way the program is designed is a digital and a, a creative uh, enterprise uh, program or development. So, number one, governors uh, must look for people who are within the digital space uh, and the creative uh, sector. So that's number one. Uh, they must avoid political considerations. Uh, just looking for party faithful in terms of those who that they are going to uh, recruit into the program. And the federal government, on the other hand, uh, the mechanism in terms of uh, impact and evaluation must start even from the point of view, uh, from the beginning of the program. So therefore, uh, the minimum threshold and benchmarks uh, for recruiting um, youth into the program must be specified. So those who are within that framework should be the ones that should come from the uh, various states. But if you make it um, for political consideration, at the end of the day, it might um, not achieve the desired impact like some other social intervention uh, in the past. Now, since this program is being funded by the African Development Bank, the French uh, Development Agency, the Islamic Development Bank, among many other organizations, shouldn't it have been directed towards uh, the tech companies themselves to facilitate this training instead of it going through the state governments, picking focal persons? Would it then turn to be a situation of having square pegs in round holes? My view is that uh, uh, the contributing agencies, particularly uh, uh, regional institutions, uh, continental institutions, and other multilateral agencies that are contributing to the scheme, uh, will put a necessary framework in terms of uh, the way uh, people will be recruited, uh, the way the program, the acqu skill acquisition. So in that regard, um, I think the vice president saying that uh, state government should find a way to uh, provide focal uh, persons and the kind of people uh, from the states uh, that we subscribe to the program. I think that's just the political aspect of it, and I'm sure that uh, due diligence uh, uh, will be drawn uh, within the digital and the creative uh, ecosystem so that um, the design of the program uh, and the outcomes uh, will become successful. Let's look at some of the objectives of this program. According to the statement released, uh, it's also to create an enabling regulatory framework and also provide access to funds. You know, when it comes to starting businesses, one of the greatest challenges is capital, the funds to start that business, and that's the essence of doing this. Now, how do we ensure that, of course, by the provision of this program, the target is uh, for young people between the ages of 15 and 35. How do we ensure that this program is targeted at people who actually need these funds? You know, young people who are actually in the ICT sector who actually need these funds and not just cronies or party members. How do we ensure that, yes, these funds get to the people who actually need the actual target for this program? In my view, because of the technical nature uh, of that sector, uh, I have a feeling that uh, those who will get into that space will be those who really need uh, uh, the funding, uh, access to funding. Uh, and uh, these funds are provided by technical partners. Therefore, uh, due diligence in terms of, uh, like I mentioned earlier, in terms of the way the African Development Bank uh, supervises their project, the other uh, uh, providers will put some mechanism in place uh, to assure that uh, that money uh, comes back because I don't think it's uh, free money. It's just a funding uh, that comes from um, those agencies that can enhance uh, development. So in my view, and I think strongly that um, uh, beyond the political consideration, I'm sure that those people that will benefit 
within the age bracket will essentially be a critical player in the digital and the creative uh, space. Now, so the Vice President is emphatic on creating skills uh, that meet global needs. Uh, so to this extent, what do you see the, 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 the results or the benefits of this program nationwide? What, what do you picture it becoming when at least uh, 1.1 million youths are trained nationwide on ICT skills? Number one, the job creation. Uh, skill acquisition, uh, which is part of human capital development, so that we uh, help, uh, particularly a lot of receive youth who don't uh, have space to even operate, to even express their creative ingenuities. Uh, this space and this opportunity uh, will enhance uh, their developmental processes, which will impact generally on the economy. Looking at the nature of the program itself, is an ICT program, so one would naturally expect that um, technology will be deployed into this. So what kind of, uh, or how do you expect that technology will be deployed into this process to make it transparent, to make it efficient, and also to bring about a proper coordination to all the activities involving this kind of program? It's even ICT, so you expect that such should be put in place. I think so. Uh, uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, have this feeling because um, it's an ICC space, and I'm sure the deployment in terms of uh, how people will be recruited, uh, the training opportunity, uh, and the way to measure uh, the social impact of, of uh, that program uh, will be ICT driven. Because uh, if that is not done, then the aim of that program in itself uh, is defeated. Uh, ab initio. So I have that strong belief that um, everything will be enabled by ICT. And I'm just hoping, uh, hopeful that beyond that uh, political dimension, uh, you know, the NEC uh, is a collective of uh, uh, state governors uh, that is being headed by the vice president. So I think that's the entry point to start because you're a member of that uh, national executive uh, uh, council. So I think it's in the right place where governors are asked to appoint focal. And each of the state, in any case, have a department of a digital economy. So I'm sure that it will rely on the pool of uh, what the states already have. Do you see this being a thing that benefits those in the urban centers only? How do you, uh, what do you prescribe as a measure to ensure that those in the rural areas also benefit from this, are able to key into it and benefit from it? I think the various state governments, uh, in some states, uh, I cannot speak for all the states, but I'm familiar with some states where uh, the ICT ecosystem uh, is well established. Therefore, I'm sure that uh, since it's coming from states, there will be equity. Uh, they will take people from various uh, local councils uh, in terms of those that will benefit uh, from it. So I don't really have uh, worries about how, because you have uh, a lot of uh, viable youths who are already playing in those sectors. So what is just needed is um, a kind of collaboration that will help them to upscale uh, their skill set in ICT and development. Looking at the partners or the stakeholders involved in this kind of program, I can't find anyone from the private sector. It's looking more or less like a public sector kind of program. Of course, the collaboration between you know, the federal government, the Bank of Industry, AFDB, and the rest of them. But don't you think that could be an error if the private sector is not being carried along? Or no, the private sector will be there. You know? Uh, when there's a policy statement, uh, it's not all the facts uh, that are in the public domain in the first instance. So that kind of uh, ecosystem uh, cannot work independently. So I'm sure that it's going to be PPP arrangement in terms of driving that process. There are people that are going to be providing uh, uh, the, the facility, knowledge, the uh, facilitating yeah. uh, those skill sets. So I'm sure that will not be in the public uh, domain. Even those who are uh, uh, providing funding, uh, we have consultants uh, working for them. So those consultants will be part of that system uh, to drive that process. So I'm sure that it's going to be comprehensive and uh, every sector and every major player within that ICT sector 
uh, will be represented. So the uh, executive director in charge of SMEs at the Bank of Industry, which is also supporting this, uh, said that the IDICE program is a special intervention by the government uh, to actually create uh, millions of jobs in the technology space. And that uh, the program is in support of government's agenda to create uh, sustainable jobs, equip digital and creative incubation hubs, innovation centers across the country. Now this brings us to sustainability. Before this time, there have been several incubation and innovation hubs spread across different states and uh, cities in Nigeria. Yes, they're assuring now of sustaining this program, but how do you see think a program like this can be sustained. The incubation hubs that will be built or perhaps equipped, how can they be sustained for more people to come on board and then the development continues? Uh, blessing, I, I'm sure that uh, since the African Development Bank uh, is the initial uh, initiator of this program, uh, I, I don't have my fears that um, they will have put uh, a framework in place for sustainability of uh, the business because they want their money. Uh, to come back. But then, uh, with every other government project in the past, uh, there may be political overbearance, uh, yes, in terms of uh, those who come into that space. But I'm sure uh, in the long run, it will be sustainable and those hubs uh, will be created. And the other African countries uh, that have similar program uh, that were supported by uh, the African Development Bank, uh, there was a particular one some three years or four years ago uh, in Kenya uh, that was very successful in uh, building up uh, ICT uh, entrepreneurs uh, in that country. So in that regard, this investment, in my view, uh, will be sustainable. Number two, because of the specialized skills uh, that you need in that sector, uh, I, I, I'm very optimistic that uh, it will be sustainable and the outcomes will be far-reaching based on uh, the program initiative. It is also important to mention that um, the program is also targeted at women. You know, according to the statement released, you know, the five-year program, at the end of the five-year program, about 80,000 women must have been empowered in terms of skill acquisition, mentorship, and all that. Do you think this will go a long way to boost the morale of young ladies who are into one business or the other and encourage them to do more? Uh, the country uh, has a national policy on gender equity and balance. So uh, that uh, component uh, represents uh, the national policy. So I'm sure that uh, uh, women uh, will be empowered. And uh, even recent development in our country, uh, when you look at women and development, a lot of women are in top places, so this initiative will encourage uh, more women uh, to take advantage of uh, ICT and in the long run, uh, the national policy on gender uh, will just uh, be met based on that uh, about 80,000 uh, women. So but when we speak uh, in terms of uh, uh, gender correctness, uh, the framing should always, don't always isolate uh, women. We should talk about uh, gender mainstreaming that take a component. So we should be gender sensitive rather than always putting a pigeonhole that uh, this so is a comprehensive program. So I'm sure that even when more women uh, subscribe and they meet the minimum requirement, that uh, projected number uh, might be far above that number in my view. So this is a program where people can enlist for free to get these skills and uh, acquire uh, various skills for which, uh, with which they can generate jobs by themselves or even get uh, employment. So what should be the checks and balance to ensure that it is not enough for people to acquire these skills, but after acquiring these skills, the ultimate goal, which is job creation, is met. They push forward to using these skills to, gen to create jobs for themselves or even to become employed? No, once they are able to have that skill set, uh, naturally, because of the space uh, they play, uh, they will become gainfully employed because they have those skill set that first and foremost will give them employment, and those employment will create other additional values in terms of uh, the service they provide. Other people will be involved in that system. So in the long run, beyond the direct beneficiary of the training who will be employed, uh, uh, to government, additional jobs will have been created, 
then they create other spaces in terms of uh, market, in terms of uh, ICT deployment to various sectors so that we uh, improve in terms of uh, the general um, uh, stability in the country, in terms of uh, providing employment for the youth, uh, the ancillary services uh, that uh, people will gain by providing uh, ICT skill uh, training program, we find a way to create uh, additional employment for other people who don't even play within those sectors because those skills will be translated into improving other sectors of the economy. Now, uh, the ICT sector contributes over 18% to Nigeria's GDP and uh, it is the, the e-commerce uh, spending is projected to grow to $75 billion by the year 2025. So the government is doing all it can to enhance uh, Nigeria's participation in the global technology trade. Aside of scaling and even scaling those in, within the ICT sector, what more can be done to ensure Nigeria gets more from the ICT sector? First is uh, to patronize uh, those people that have uh, ICT skill set uh, in terms of uh, the service uh, they offer. So that will upscale um, the processes that will help to sustain that uh, particular uh, revenue stream uh, from that sector. So essentially, uh, this uh, initiative will help to um, scale up uh, the process in terms of uh, technical skills in ICT and once that is scaled up, then those people are able to provide uh, services within that sector. And uh, in the long run, uh, we will benefit beyond uh, that projection uh, that you just spoke about uh, earlier. These ideas of this program looks good on paper. But when it comes to implementation, there are concerns, especially in this climate where similar programs were introduced in the past and yet the purpose weren't achieved. Now, what are the common mistakes or setbacks or shortfalls that should be avoided this time around to ensure that this program you know, achieves the aim intended? Once the uh, government trying to provide uh, social interventions, uh, particularly programs uh, that will uh, scale up activities of uh, youth, number one, uh, the government uh, must uh, take herself uh, from the political uh, overbearing influence that they have uh, more often than not in their project. So that's the first one. Once uh, politics uh, is removed, then the uh, input, output, and the outcome uh, become very easy to measure. Because the question is, uh, why do some of these uh, projects or programs uh, succeed elsewhere and they don't succeed here? So I think is. Uh, too much interference uh, from the political class in whatever comes from government. So we're able to avoid too much politics uh, in the affairs of those programs. The program's outcome uh, become more measurable, become more successful, and the social impact on society uh, will be very high, in my view. So what you are saying now is transparency will be needed to have this program run. So the, the ages of the people who will be involved in this program, uh, 15 to 35, from that age 15 maybe to 20, you may still have some of them in schools and uh, maybe some just live in school. But for those in school, uh, how do you think it's going to run side by side their academic programs so that they also get the chance to participate in it? I'm sure the uh, visioneer of the program uh, will have taken cognizance of uh, those age bracket, that demography that represents a chunk of youth that will still be in school. I'm sure the program will be uh, tied uh, to their normal school program because most schools now are designed to have an entrepreneur entrepreneurship uh, program. So I'm sure those who design the program, because we don't really have the details, uh, will take cognizance of uh, age 15, maybe to 19, who will still be in school. Uh, on the average, um, a child's development that is very okay by age 20, 21, they will have been out of school. So I'm sure different program uh, for different uh, demography within that. Uh, uh, so they will take cognizance of that. So those who are in school, they have some hours, some time that they will use 
uh, for acquiring those uh, skills. And I, I'm sure that it will be tied to technical colleges where you already have uh, departments of ICT in terms of um, laboratories and uh, the technical skills to acquire those uh, knowledge. Let's look at the issue of unemployment in Nigeria. Um, according to statistics released by the Bureau, uh, National Bureau of Statistics, for the last quarter of the year, unemployment increased by 5.0%. And you observe that government is making effort, but it's looking like government needs to do more. What are other areas that you feel government should improve on to tackle the issue of unemployment in Nigeria? And then what also should be the role of private organizations in tackling unemployment in Nigeria? On the part of government, uh, uh, this initiative in terms of digital and creative uh, uh, development program, that is already addressing uh, one aspect. Uh, if you look at the aggregate of the number of youths uh, that will come from the 36 states, and uh, if the project is uh, quickly implemented, as they promise that in the next one or two weeks, uh, the program will be running. That will create uh, some job. On the other hand, um, the government through universities and polytechnic uh, uh, must work with the town uh, in such a way that um, uh, the curriculum that is designed by various uh, ministries in terms of uh, state, uh, local government education uh, department should find a way to design uh, courses uh, that are in reality with a market demand so that that um, as you're leaving school, uh, there's already a space uh, for you to work. Uh, this can help to reduce uh, the level of, uh, of unemployment. So, on the other hand, private sector too must find a way to put some element of investment, even though they're already overburdened in terms of uh, uh, taxation, in terms of education tasks and some other tasks, to see how uh, they can collaborate with uh, universities, research centers, uh, to develop skill sets that are dedicated to their various uh, areas of uh, operation. Talking about skill sets, some people already possess this skill set that will be uh, transferred now to others. Uh, it seems like it's time for, uh, it, it's a busy period for them as they may be engaged to as facilitators in this program. Yes, that's, the, the program itself is, is already uh, an enabler uh, there are people who are going to benefit. There are people who are going to pass knowledge and the skill set to the other people. So uh, at the end of the day, you see that um, in a holistic manner, uh, some people that are underemployed uh, within that sector, uh, we have opportunity uh, to coach and mentor other people. And that, again, uh, will increase the level of uh, ICT performance in Nigeria. Looking at the peculiarity of this kind of program, don't you think people in the rural areas or the young people in those areas might likely miss out looking at the sensitivity and then the peculiarity of this kind of program? I'm not too sure that uh, they are going to lose that uh, completely. Uh, number one, uh, when the vice president say governors should get people from your state, uh, I'm sure the constituencies of the gov uh, governors uh, cut across all the local government of the state, and they have a way of uh, reaching out. Uh, uh, you have um, an ecosystem where the best in every sector uh, will come from various local governments. So I don't really, personally, I don't have that fear. I'm always, uh, like Blessing asked earlier, to what extent can this program be sustainable? What are the benchmarks? What are the milestones uh, for measuring this uh, program? So. The announcement has been made, we are discussing. Now, so in another one month, we should be looking at those who play in the media space. What is the level of this project? How many people have been recruited? What is the ratio of uh, the girl child uh, to the boy child based on the parameter that we talked about earlier? So if we're able to put a tray on the activities, then we'll be able to measure the sources. So if there are gaps, if there are challenges, you are able to highlight them in the public and those who run the program will be able to make uh, adjustments. 
Now, talking about uh, measurements, uh, the IMF wants to enable central banks globally to assess what you're doing and also measure transparency as it has developed uh, a transparency code that helps central banks to assess and improve their practices. So the IMF says that the transparency code, which is called CBT, uh, is an international code that allows central banks and their stakeholders to map transparency, in pra transparency practices of the central bank to international best practices. What do you see as the reason for this? Uh, thank you. I think uh, uh, the IMF uh, uh, just came out with um, a five-pillar uh, transparency initiative, which we call the CBT. Uh, the idea is uh, in to improve on the governance ecosystems of a uh, central bank of a uh, member state. The idea is uh, to enhance transparency in terms of central banking operation, uh, you talk about uh, effectiveness in terms of public sector uh, delivery. Uh, to what extent uh, are the mechanism or the framework, the regulatory framework uh, within the central banking systems uh, adhere uh, uh, to improving on citizens? And so those are the parameters. So is um, a system uh, put in place to measure the performance of uh, central banks of a member state that belongs to uh, the IMF. So talk about transparency, accountability, openness, effectiveness. And uh, the last one I think is about public service delivery or thereabout. So this ecosystem will be a minimum threshold or a benchmark uh, for measuring uh, the performance of a uh, central bank. So uh, if they are falling off the line in terms of their core mandate, uh, then these um, uh, five pillars uh, will be the basis of uh, how you uh, look at central banking systems among the member states that make up the IMF. Now, the, looking at the five pillars, the first on the list is the issue of governance. How will you assess the internal governance or internal uh, mechanism within the central bank, making reference to that of Nigeria? How will you assess that? And then, how will this impact internal governance of those central banks? So these new pillars uh, uh, will improve uh, on the governance structure, that means uh, corporate governance uh, within the central bank. Uh, how do you appoint uh, uh, the governors of the central banks, uh, deputy governors of the central bank? What are the mechanisms in terms of um, how you respond uh, to being uh, a banker or bankers, how do you uh, do monetary uh, framework uh, within uh, the way the central banks operate elsewhere. So this will help to sustain uh, the governance system. So what is we help to civil society organizations? Uh, we key into uh, these new pillars uh, with a view to see how transparent how open, how efficient, how effective uh, the central banks uh, help in trying to regulate uh, the monetary framework of a specific country. I just think this is a window uh, for measuring uh, the performance of the uh, central bankers uh, beyond the appointing authority of uh, those countries. So the IMF says that the transparency, uh, the central bank's transparency code is not intended as a governance code. But is there a difference if you're setting pillars upon which the practices of central banks can be assessed? No, what you're trying to say here is that um, uh, if you look at it from the domain of uh, international relation, uh, sovereignty uh, is very critical. So what that says uh, to some extent is that they don't want to impugn on the sovereignty of uh, the member state. So, but then you put a window of an assessment which give uh, a kind of opportunity for those who cannot really um, look at the activity of the central bank. That window on governance uh, bring to fore, particularly from civil society point of view, that uh, you can put a lens of observation in terms of how um, 
the governor of the central bank is recruited? How are the deputy governors, how do they align with the regulatory framework that is put uh, in place by respective countries? So I think that's just a political statement, uh, not in, uh, in part on the sovereignty of uh, member states in terms of what they do with their central bank. I'm wondering why is it important for IMF to introduce this code? Uh, this is what ideally the central banks of the nation members should imbibe. Talking about governance, you know, talking about uh, policies. These are things that should be internal rather than having an intervention from a body like IMF. Why is it important for IMF to put a voice to this? Uh, Femi, uh, number one, uh, first and foremost, each of these central uh, banks already have their governance framework based on the regulatory framework that enable uh, the establishment of the central bank in the first uh, instance. So that's, that's given. On the other hand, uh, some of the monies uh, that you go and uh, borrow from the IMF, uh, they need to have a way to see that when you bring, take their money, those monies are dispensed uh, transparently in a manner that it will impact on the citizen or the money goes uh, to the sector to which those monies are, are borrowed because when you borrow those money they come through uh, those institutions so I have the uh, feeling that um, uh, in terms of their uh, revenue assurance they are putting certain uh, governance structure in place so that uh, the civil society uh, will be whistleblowers in terms of infra infractions that will be made into some of their lending. Those are just my, my thinking. But then it doesn't take away uh, the place of uh, the existing internal mechanism uh, of how central banks uh, manage themselves. But is this not an indictment on the credibility of central banks of different countries? Because the apex bank of any nation is supposed to be seen as one where transparency and best, uh, uh, what best practice adheres to? No, I don't think so. Uh, is their own ecosystems uh, that is uh, central banks of member states uh, may already may have subscribed to uh, when they are working on those uh, modality. Like I said earlier, um, within the corporate governance framework, within different countries, that is already in place. But then you have an interface with these uh, Bretton Woods institutions. They are saying um, uh, they are acting like a kind of um, an ombudsman who checks on the activities of uh, central banks of member states and the idea uh, is not to take the function of central banks rather is to improve on the working mechanism in terms of transparency openness and accountability on how they deploy public resources uh, that is domiciled with the central bank i think that's uh, in my view and which i spoke to earlier when i talk about sovereignty but this is just like a whistleblowing uh, pillar that people can use to assess the activities of uh, central banks. The second pillar of this framework talks about policies, operations. Um, the CBN, under the former handler, was accused of you know, not having the right operations or operations somersault. How do you see the present CBN governor you know, uh, improving on this in terms of policies? When it comes to policies, the CBN is vested with monitoring policies. Looking at the CBN government in Nigeria and the present administration, how are they handling this and what would be your assessment? Because this is also talking about not just the policies as well, but the implementation and the operations of these policies. It might be difficult to provide a scorecard on the CBN governor uh, yeah, but it's just your currently, opinion. yeah, currently, but uh, I'm going somewhere. I just wanted to lay that uh, background. So. Uh, I'm not putting a boss uh, to make comments. Uh, is the employer of the, gov of the governor of the CBN that will be able to do that? But in any case, uh, what that's uh, number two pillar in terms of uh, policy uh, framework. So the central bank uh, should focus on its core mandate of monetary policy within the uh, framework that established 
or the first, uh, first, um, central bank in the first instance. So uh, you don't act uh, beyond uh, the framework that uh, establishes you. So, so in terms of policy, what are the policy framework that will help to direct uh, monetary and economic policy of the country? So they must improve on the policy regime rather than the CBN governor uh, who go beyond his core mandate and get involved in some things that are alien uh, uh, to central banking principles and practice. I think that's what that number two uh, speaks to. So if you have a policy option, a policy initiative uh, that has been put in place, you make sure that that policy initiative go through the process of implementation, evaluation, and look at impact and how does that benefit uh, the citizen of that country. In terms of official relations with government and other agencies, which is uh, the fifth pillar of this uh, framework, uh, how do you see that benefiting a country like Nigeria in terms of synergy with other agencies? Yeah, I think it's just uh, looking at um, um, a collaborative framework or partnership uh, that will sustain how governance, our best practices, our transparency and openness uh, is practiced uh, within other central banks. So uh, what that will prove is that uh, it's like a peer review mechanism uh, that will help you to improve on your existing structure in terms of um, your organization, in, in, in terms of policy. So that will help uh, to improve on the principles and practice of central banking uh, across uh, the countries that make up uh, the IMF. There's a statement credited to the IMF MD, and I would like you to I would like you to react to it. it says that um, strong governance and independence means central bankers should have control over their budgets and personnel, not to be subject to easy dismissal based on their policy views or actions taken within the legal mandate. And that speaks to uh, the independence of uh, the central bank. Uh, where you are not subject uh, to the whim and caprices of uh, the appointing authority. And based on the uh, regulatory framework, I think uh, the central bank has a tenure uh, in place. So within that tenure, if it's a five-year tenure, uh, they have the opportunity to stay within that uh, uh, five years tenure. So uh, you don't disrupt uh, the policy uh, uh, framework that is in put in place by those who are um, so politically they should be isolated uh, to the whims and caprices of uh, the appointing authority and then that's what that speaks to independence and that independence uh, even though if you're independent you must be open you must be transparent thank you very much sam Aruji, for your time on the show today thank you blessing my pleasure Early exchange, shaping policy, advancing development.